Video five of chapter eight, we're going to continue on looking at some confidence intervals for proportions, but this time around, we've got two proportions. So besides calculating, calculating a confidence interval or a CI for one sample, oftentimes it is helpful to calculate a confidence interval for the difference in two samples. And oftentimes we will want to answer the question, is there a difference in the proportions between two different populations. So we're going to look at an example in this video together. We're going to work through the whole thing. And then I'm going to leave you with a little you do problem to consider. You don't have to calculate anything, just a question to try to answer. So are juniors or seniors more likely to attend prom? And you might think, well, seniors, obviously it's, it's their last big dance, right? Or some of you might be thinking, well, juniors would, right? It's their first big dance, right? They, they normally can't go to prom unless they're asked by an upperclassman. So this is the first time they can really go to prom. So I don't know who's more likely to attend, juniors or seniors. So to find out at a large school, separate random samples of 50 from each class are taken. 30 of the 50 juniors and 33 of the 50 seniors randomly selected plan to attend prom this year. We are going to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the difference in the proportions of juniors and seniors planning to attend prom this year. So again, keep in mind, on the formula sheet, you aren't really given much help here. You are told, in general, generically, this particular formula. You want to take a statistic, plus or minus a critical value, times the standard error of the statistic. So our statistic again is our point estimate. This is the value taken from our sample. The critical value again represents, well, how many standard deviations do we want? Depends on that confidence level specifically. And then the standard error of the statistic is basically our standard deviation. But things look a little different when it's the difference of two proportions. Instead of just having p hat for our statistic, it is the difference of our sample proportions. Now, the one and the two kind of depends on which way you want to subtract. Do you want to do juniors minus seniors, or do you want to do seniors minus juniors? Doesn't matter which one you do, and it honestly doesn't matter. You can get the same technical confidence interval. It's not going to be the same exact numbers, uh, but it'll be very, very similar. It's going to lead us to the same exact results. Now, there's still only one critical value. So that's kind of the one part that doesn't double in size. There's not all of a sudden two critical values. It's not like we want a 94% level for, for juniors and a 98% uh, confidence level for seniors. It is just still one confidence level. And it's still going to be calculated the same exact way we did before. The standard deviation part, again, it looks like it doubles in size. It looks like we have two of those standard error formulas. And again, because we are subtracting, we never subtract the standard deviations. We always added them underneath. And so again, most of these values are from the samples and you have to be given these numbers in the problem. The only thing we are really going to be in charge of is figuring out what is that critical value. So, we need to follow the three C's like we did when this was a one sample problem. We've got our conditions, we need to do our calculations, and we need to write our conclusion. So our three conditions, the random, independent, and normal conditions. So first for the random, well, instead of there just being one random sample, you have to be told that there are two random samples specifically. And so again, we're going to use our example here. Were there two random samples? I don't know. Let me go back and reread the information. Uh, separate random samples of 50 from each class are taken. So let me jump back to here. So I would say says, and then I would just quote exactly what the problem stated. That way, if you directly quote what the problem says, there's no misinterpretation of what you meant and what you thought the problem meant. So separate random samples. And again, this has to be from two random samples. So notice I'm making sure that I don't just say random sample, um, but I'm classifying that th these are really two samples here. So separate random samples of 50 each. And then end quote. That's exactly what the problem said.
right? Let me jump back. A 50, oh, from each. My bad, from each. And then if I want to include that whole statement, I could. So of 50 from each class. So there, I'm good with the random condition. Now the independent or the 10% condition, since there are technically two populations, I would have to check this twice. And we did this back last chapter where you had to check this condition two times. So the one and the two, this is where I kind of need to make a decision now. Who do I want to call the ones and who do I want to call the twos? Juniors versus seniors. And I think it's all going to come down to when I go to subtract my sample proportions for the point estimate. So which sample proportion was larger? And the seniors was the larger sample proportion. The P hat for them would be 0.66 and the P hat for the juniors would be 0 0.60. So I'm going to call the seniors really the one, or really I don't need the one and the two. I can just use S and J, right? We can do that. So instead of saying pop one, we'll say pop S and we'll have pop J. And so we'll say all seniors greater than or equal to, now my sample size was 50, so 10 times 50. Can I assume that there are more than 500 seniors from this school? Because again, we're not considering out of all schools, but just this one school in general. And then can I also assume that there are over 500 juniors from this? If I can spell school right here, there we go greater than or equal to 500. And I don't know, that, that seems like a lot of people, right? So let me go back and let me see. To find out at a, ooh, they gave me an adjective that describes this school. It is a large school. Now, some of you might be going, well, I don't know, I, I, I'm from a large school. We don't have 500 in our senior class. But we will assume that this is a true statement. So in both of these, we'll just say assume true. We'll assume a large school means that there are more than 500 people per grade level. Now our third condition for the normal condition is n times p and n times 1 minus p. But remember we don't have values for p, the population proportion, but we do have values for the sample proportions. But again I have to check if both of these are true for the senior population and for the junior population. Now, we had talked previously that really n times p represented the number of successes, and n times 1 minus p represented the number of failures overall. So if you remember, for the seniors, the seniors I was calling the 1, so this is really n sub s and then p hat sub s, and so let me just switch these 1s to s's, and let me switch these 2s to j's for juniors. The n times p hat sub s, and I'll just do the math for this first one here. We had 50 seniors, and then our sample proportion of those seniors that did go to prom was 33 out of 50, but notice the 50 and the out of 50 cancel out, and so we're just left with the 33 seniors that said they were going to go to prom. So 33 is greater than or equal to 10, and if 33 were planning on going to prom, how many were not planning on going on to prom? going to prom out of those 50. Well, the n times 1 minus p hat sub s would really be the other 17 seniors that were sampled. So 33 and 17 are both greater than or equal to 10. We're good for the seniors, but we also have to check to make sure it's good for the juniors. So again, I'm not going to do the math here, but what is this number going to come out to be? It's going to be the 30 juniors that said they were going to go to prom. And how many juniors don't plan on going to prom out of that 50? Well, that would leave me with the leftover 20. And so all four of these numbers are greater than or equal to 10. And therefore, overall, the sampling distribution of the difference of the sample proportions is approximately normal. And we are good to proceed on. Now, for the calculations, remember this crazy long looking formula here, you can plug and chug your heart away here, but I am going to share with you in the video how we could use our calculator. There is a command that will do this confidence interval for us. Now, if you would rather plug and chug away, again, you may certainly 
do that to your heart's content. But I will share with you where in your calculator that you can have it do the calculations for you. So if you press the stat button on your Texas Instruments calculator and scroll over to tests, this was the same area where we did a one proportion Z interval when we just had one sample. But now we have two proportions or two samples. So we want a two prop Z int or interval. Now, the thing is, if you're not going to plug and chug your way with this formula, you have to state the name of the procedure that you're doing here. You either have to state the name of the procedure or write out the full formula. And so again, you do you want to write all this out or would you rather practice on naming the name of this procedure? It's you can't just call it a two prop Z int because that's not the proper name of the procedure. It is a two sample Z confidence interval for a difference in proportions. And once we get through all these different tests and confidence intervals and the next round of uh, material that we're going to cover with hypothesis testing, all of these kind of work in little chunks here. We've got how many samples do we have? What kind of main procedure are we doing? And then what are we doing it with? Is it a difference or just not a difference in proportions or means? So eventually there will be some, uh, there'll be a, like a pattern that'll work with these. So when we go to a two prop Z interval, the first thing that we see in our table here is it asks for X1, N1, X2, and N2. And so what X1 and N1 really represent are the numerator and the denominator of whatever the first sample proportion is. And X2 and N2 represent the numerator and denominator of the second sample proportion. So with our, ooh, and I flipped this around here, because previously I said I was going to let the ones be my seniors and the twos be my juniors, but I ended up doing this the other way around. So I apologize. So here are my P hat sub J, and then here represents my P hat sub S. And I wanted to set this at a 95% confidence level. And whenever I tell the calculator to calculate, it sure enough does all of this in a split second and tells me here is your confidence interval. So how do we now, because this is the part you need to write down on your paper, once you have written out, here's the name of the procedure that I'm using, and then you do all of this in your calculator, and then you go, uh, I, I totally plug and chugged all of that stuff with this formula. I totally did all that. Totally, totally did all that. And here was the answer that I got for my confidence interval. And one thing you'll notice is that there's a negative on this lower end and the upper value is a positive value. Don't be freaked out if you see negatives, one or two or maybe zero, negative values in a confidence interval. That will commonly happen when we look at a difference because maybe one difference is larger than the other difference. And so depending on which way we subtract, there may or may not be some negative differences within our confidence interval. So now let's write our conclusion. And really it's gonna be the same generic statement that we have written before, but now we have to express it as a difference in proportion. So we are going to conclude that we are 95% confident that the difference in the proportion, the proportions of, and again, remember the way that I did this was technically I did juniors minus seniors. Now, if you did seniors minus juniors, you're going to see these same two numbers, but they're going to be flip-flopped around. That 12% number is now going to be a negative 12% number, and that negative 24% number is going to be on the other end to be a positive 24% number. So you'll see those same two numbers, but it just flip-flops in values. So we are 95% confident that the difference in the proportions of juniors and seniors, seniors, who plan on attending prom this year 
We're going to be as specific as possible, I know. A lot of information. Is between negative 24.89% and 12 point, we'll go 89%. So again, we're 95% confident that that difference in the proportions of juniors and seniors who plan on attending prom is somewhere between about negative 25% all the way up to a about almost 13% difference. So that leads us now into the you do problem. Is there a difference in the proportions between our two different populations? Remember we said we are 95% confident that the difference is going to be somewhere between negative 25-ish percent and positive 13-ish percent. So the thing I want you to consider here, if there was no difference between the juniors and the seniors attending prom, if there was no difference in those two proportions, what number would we associate with no difference? What number would we associate with no difference? And is that number in our confidence interval? Is it a plausible value that we might have captured with our confidence interval? So we will discuss that the next day in class.